to begin with, I was used to um, the long haul project because Gatsby took me six years um, while doing other things, other books, and also working full time as a lawyer. But Hamlet, um, I anticipated, would take between three and four years. Uh, it did keep getting longer as I was working on it. But uh, when I was about halfway through the finished work, I um, joyfully uh, became pregnant and realised that I had uh, nine months to do about 200 pages of finished illustration. So, And I was working part-time as a lawyer. So from that point, uh, it was a very abnormal life in that every waking minute and a lot of the dreaming minutes were spent thinking about Hamlet and um, my my wonderful husband practically didn't see me for nine months. Yeah, we need um, to really so interview I, Stu about this. <laughs> <laughs> he can tell you about a lot of TV and a lot of computer games. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so it, I think Hamlet is a play about obsession and it's a play that tends to engender obsession in the people who engage with it, directors and actors usually. And... Um, in some ways, having that intensity of, of work was actually very fitting because I was thinking about it all the time. And to be, I think, to maintain the momentum and the consistency in a project this long, you do need to be immersed in it um, almost 24-7, as you've, yes. you've probably found yeah, with that's, your that's, own work. that's my experience. I mean, part of it is that you're dealing with so many layers of subtlety, I think, um, that they're, they're easy to forget. Um, exactly. And the stop, start, which unfortunately or fortunately in in real life as an artist you do have to stop and start work um you forget little things yeah absolutely and I, and um i became an obsessive note taker any time i woke up in the night and had an idea about how Rosencrantz and Guildenstern should be interacting with Hamlet in a particular scene and I'd quickly write it down so i've got a sketchbook um yeah well, you should show us um an example of your of, wonderful of sketchbook. these <laughs> sketchbooks um, that are just full of notes and uh, character designs and background designs and so on. And this just goes on and on and on. Um, loads of and oh, <laughs> quick grab it. in action <laughs> and, uh, and lots and lots and lots of written notes. And I actually um, I was reading on Hamlet, of course, before I began, but I continued to read commentary um, and criticism throughout and would um, have to sometimes, as I changed my views about it, rejig things while I was working. And there's also, and I imagine you would have experienced this, but um, having to constantly move your focus from the, the whole to the particular and make sure that the particular oh, yes, fits yep. in well with the whole and how does the thing happening in you know, act three, scene four, yep. you know, go uh, fit in with the, the thing happening in another it's, scene. I guess it's the key difference between um, working as a, say, a painter producing work for an exhibition and creating a, a graphic novel, which is much closer to directing a film, uh, where continuity is everything. The individual works aren't the work, it's the whole work as a, a, a singular mass that flows with a certain rhythm. Yep, and yeah, very, very much so. And I, I might actually show you my the image of my planner that I had up on the wall. I'll go <laughs> backwards. That, that, that's the planner. Um, this is the thing that I had on the wall over my desk, um, which changed. Actually, redid it when I was halfway through through the book, and that shows each um, scene of the play. The colour coding is for the different um, places that the scenes take place and the the very vividly colored backgrounds in the book are actually individually painted theater sets so i painted um seven plus the set for the play within the play so eight sets and uh, this just shows which set applies to each scene by color coding and you can also see that about half of each of those boxes is written in pen that's a little summary of what takes place in the play in that scene. Um, the stuff written in pencil is a summary of what's going on in the single spread at the end of each scene, which is the backstage scene. Because as Sean mentioned, um, this uh, the, um, the book is actually set up as um, a theatre, as, as um, happening in a theatre, and the actors play out their parts against these sets, and you can then flip 
at the end of um, each scene and see what's going on backstage. So just to um, explain, this is kind of like the first uh, page of actual um, play that we see and uh, um, of course we have the, the curtain motif um, which is, is not exactly like a curtain it's sort of like the suggestion of a curtain and a very sort of abstract looking brightly coloured background which has a has a key uh, colour identity and um, I can see that that relates to obviously the blue squares that you had on the layout and then um, the backstage scenes um, sort of appear like this where we sort of see this kind of papery uh, background stage and the same characters are there but they're obviously not playing the same roles because they're behaving very differently and they don't speak here either. No, they, they don't speak because um, I thought it would be pretty presumptuous to add any, um, any words to Shakespeare's play. Um, but what is going on backstage is not an exact parallel to what happens on stage, but there are certain things in common. There's the theme of revenge and questioning the, the very motivation of revenge. I mean, Hamlet has his struggles with it, but he never explicitly asks, is it actually moral to to seek revenge. He assumes that it's what he should be doing, even though he has some difficulties with it. But part of what I wanted to explore backstage was, um, was whether revenge is actually justifiable and whether it brings any um, moral or emotional relief. And I don't know that it... it uh, I, I don't believe that yeah, it really yeah. does. But there's other things going on about identity because um, one of the central concerns of Hamlet, and it's funny to say central because there are so many key concerns of this play, is who we are and what we are and what is real, what is artifice um, and uh, what's, what's acting. Um, so bringing us backstage and seeing the characters who we've come to accept as, as real on stage because we're caught up in the play, hopefully, um, taking on very different relationships but which have some crossover. And at the end, there is actually a twist, which I won't give away, where the two worlds do collide um, in a, I think, quite surprising way. Yeah, it's actually quite interesting because as well as... Um, Hamlet, the you know the original Hamlet having a play within a play, you have a play outside of the play, and I think that that is a really great device and it works perfectly perfectly well. Um, I, I did have to go through and and sort of like uh, you have to go through and kind of examine it because it's it's sort of happening so separately. But um, then uh, afterwards, you, you sort of understand how it all ties up and it connects with those central themes, which is really good because I think when you're reading Hamlet. Um, just to get to this theme of revenge, you are wanting him to exact revenge. Absolutely. Because the, the, the king or the king's brother who has taken over the throne is, is such a nasty piece of work and then such a um, consciously malicious character. That's Although right. he does have some, I guess, noble aspects in some ways, but he's... I've seen him played um, in the, the Bell Shakespeare production, I think a, a year or so ago, and he was played so well as a sort of quite efficient and quite um, a talented politician. Yeah. And I actually found myself quite liking him, and that was, I mean, partly because the Hamlet was played as a horrible brat. Um, and, you can, and, you know, there are just so many interpretations, but I think in in... My rendering, I very much identified with the Hamlet character, as I think you inevitably do if you're if you're reading this play, um, and struggling with him because he's a complicated one, and he's not um, he's certainly not always good, and he's not always uh, his actions are not always, not always in fact, sometimes either. they're yeah. sometimes they're hideous. <laughs> um, but I think you, you are on side with Hamlet and you do want him to, to, to follow through and exact his, his revenge. Um, so maybe uh, you could talk a little bit about the development of that particular character. Um, sure. Um, because he's, he's sort of quite a standout um, because uh, he's fairly simple and um, he is a, you know, I kind of assume him as like a bit of a punk sort of character. He's quite edgy and um, where the other characters have a, a sort of more clearly defined animal form, um, like this sort of fairy or, um, you know, blobby or something, he's like a splat. And um, for me, it kind of carries the central idea of 
um, the energy of Hamlet and um, also the self-consciousness of what you're doing as an artist of like, I'm going to, you know, this, the core concept that kind of gets you in is okay, Hamlet is a blob of ink yeah. and it's it's been shot onto the page in a sense. Yeah, um, I'm very glad that comes through. Uh, I, I had the idea from the very beginning, the first sort of concept that Hamlet would be made of ink, that all the characters would be made of ink and part of that is about... Um, reminding us of what this play is. It's a construct, it's ink on paper, whether, whether as written by Shakespeare or as, uh, as adapted in graphic form. Um, and that, again, is another layer in that question of what's real and what's constructed. Um, and hopefully the, the, the book is engaging enough that you get caught up and believe you're in a real... You know, you, you follow the story and feel caught up in it. But then there's this reminder that... Um, that it is something constructed and so you have Hamlet made of ink um, his sword is a steel nib um, others of the characters carry big brushes as swords and there's often situations where people are splattered or or drawn um, or stretched by the swords mm -hmm. um, so that was a that was a concept from the very beginning um, also the other idea with the ink is that you, you've seen that around the um, around the panels Around the, yeah. around the panels there is black ink and I'm really interested in the way that the, the devices or the building blocks of, um, of comics can be interrogated or stretched or used, uh, used in interesting ways. So I didn't want that blackness just to be something to divide frame one from frame two. I wanted it to play a role. Mm. Um, and so, for example, here, where you have things that happen in the black space around the frames, these are things that don't happen on stage, but things that are reported by the characters or imagined or dreamed or feared. Um, in this case, it's the Queen Gertrude's report of Ophelia's death. And so we're questioning whether this is something that exists purely in the imagination or whether uh, wh how real it is. Um, but we also have the blackness actually coming into the stage and interacting with the characters as in this this page where it's turning into these sort of monstrous um, snapping plants that are tearing at Ophelia and um, there's a you know to digress I'm very interested in the whole uh, treatment of Ophelia and how she's um, she's pushed and pulled and constrained and torn apart by the people around her. Um, I actually feel that her tragedy is greater than Hamlet's, uh, after all. But to, so, so this is a very long way of talking about the concept of Hamlet as a blob, blob of ink. It's integrated with the, the concept of the book as a whole mm -hmm. and, and this focus on ink. But um, how, how I came up with him in that sort of strange um, punk ink splat feline form um, Quite a few years ago, I did a, a one-page, oh, actually a two-page um, comic uh, based around this little creature. And the, the central question of this is, where did this thing come from? This thing was an idea. Um, was it just formed out of a protoplasmic ink? And how does the thing come from your brain to the, the page, which I think is probably what yeah. what we wonder every time we pick up yeah. a pen. Yeah, so did you drew this first and then started thinking about that? Uh, I drew... Oh, well, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, I, I drew this with... with I was, I suppose, doodling, and that question yeah. came came to where did this I mean, that's creature how it is. come from? That's how it is for me. I don't sort of have the theory or conceptual approach when I start. I just um, classic counterpart would be the character Eric, who is like a spiky little guy, and and that was just sitting in my sketchbooks for ages. It's just this outline with the word Eric written underneath. It's like, I don't know what that's about, but I uh, kept coming back to it again and again. What is it about heads with, you know, points emanating from don't know, them? I don't know. I think it's, um, it immediately marks them as non-human. Yeah. Yeah, and non-contained. Because our heads are round. we got round little ears and, you know. <laughs> um, and maybe that's why punk rockers actually do that is because it's so starkly in contrast to uh, the conservative forms of the human head. Yep. I think that's good. I'm going to use that. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> my question answered. <laughs> um, well, so he, he was the, the prototype of Hamlet, though when I did him, I didn't know he would be Hamlet. And when I started with the idea of Hamlet, this was what came to mind because I wanted them to be mm. in creatures and probably um, subconsciously for all the reasons that, that you've mentioned. Yeah, I mean, um, there's certainly the, the, the personalities there. And um, also I notice in the character Hamlet um, that his, his eyes often kind of look at askance a little bit like he's not staring at any he's not looking directly at things which yeah. kind of gives a little hint of a, almost like he's too cool or he's a little bit mad or something yeah it's very he, subtle he was without a doubt the hardest character to um get right for this book i don't want to leave this one up for too long because it's such a terrible drawing um but i tried all sorts of stuff um and although you know if you if you flipped through this, you'd see just Hamlet after Hamlet, and this is only one of quite a number of books. And he looks vaguely similar in concept, though sometimes he, he looks a bit like Sonic the Hedgehog. Um, but to get him right and to get the um, flexibility of expression, um, the placement of the face on the head, the way of moving, it just took so long. And I know that... that the character who appears in the book looks incredibly simple, but he was really difficult. The other characters um, popped out more fully formed. Uh, this, this was a bit of a practice exercise to, um, to work on different expressions for Hamlet. So I, um, I just opened the play at random, um, found the nearest line that Hamlet spoke and tried to draw a face that, um, that would suit that line. So it felt actually very much like um, performing, albeit in a very slow and um, painstaking mm. way. Yeah. Should also mention that their faces are removable. Yes. Um, they're just, they're masks. So they're masks. it's very theatrical. Exactly. Um, and that's how the book opens. Um, there's, a, there's a prologue where I've... Um, quoted a passage from earlier in the play when when Hamlet's talking about his his plot to stage the play in front of Claudius and he says I've heard that guilty creatures sitting at a, at a play have by the very cunning of the scene been struck so to the soul that presently they've proclaimed their malefactions and the idea of putting this in as a prologue and it's Hamlet having put his face on is, is that we as the on. audience or the readers we might be those guilty creatures sitting at a play. And this play that's about to be staged in front of us, this play of Hamlet, might be striking us to the soul in some way, whether it's, you know, our own issues about guilt, about revenge, about family, about what... It, I mean, Hamlet touches a chord in so many ways, so I kind of wanted to be uh, staging that play for, for an audience who might, who might be struck so to the soul. Yeah. If, if they've done something naughty, you mean? With protection <laughs> again. <laughs> um, yeah, um, so uh, maybe, you, it's a, maybe we should go back and, and talk a little bit about um, Gatsby and um, follow some of your slide progressions. Sure, I wonder if I can go forwards through this. There's, there's some of the other characters. Well, there. I guess, yeah, it's a good point. Well, we're here to talk about the other characters a little bit. Um, and it's interesting to see that they, they do sort of have quite an animalistic aspect to them like right from the beginning um do you have any thoughts on on your choice of animals and why you're attracted to i'd call them animal personages uh i think it uh, a lot of that comes without a great deal of intellectualizing about it something some things in a lot of things in doing this hamlet were very much um thought out in a conceptual way like that whole ink concept yeah. but the forms of the characters was much more intuitive and certainly for gatsby it was really a very personal and intimate response to those characters um so uh, claudius the king um who who in my version, this is an early sketch of Claudius, he was sort of simplified, but he was actually based on a weasel ball, that, that um, little toy that's stuck to a ball which rolls around to, you know, to drive cats crazy. Um, so he was... And in connection with Hamlet looking a bit like a cat then? Oh, the things you're picking up on, I didn't see. Oh, well, my, my subconscious must be working on it. <laughs> the mighty opposites, cat and weasel ball. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I see a series. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, Ophelia, this was an early drawing of Ophelia, and she didn't change all that much. I mean, Ophelia, Ophelia popped out almost fully formed, and, you know, Ophelia's gorgeous and, and um, 
you know, sweet and sexy and um, and fragile. And so, and I think um, often Ophelia just turn, is turned into a cut-out doll and I wanted to, her to be a fully realised character in this production. And, um, and I really did want to make something of her tragedy and not just the tragedy of beautiful woman dies. Uh, you know, there's so much more to her than that. Um, so she did... She did pop out with her sort of fallopian ears almost fully formed. <laughs> with the king, for instance, um, uh, well, also one of the things you notice if you're just flipping through is, is you know, quite obvious things like the fact that the queen has um, six breasts, uh, you know, which is sort of straight away you're going, well, what's that all about? Um, but it actually fits in quite well with her character because I always did read her as, as a kind of quite sort of sexual character and she's quite a strange one I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on her her form and how that reflects her personality um, that's that's a pretty easy one to answer because I had a very uh, gut reaction to Gertrude um, I didn't like her I know she's been played all kinds of ways I've seen a fantastic playing of a snippet of her in a, a Canadian miniseries called Slings and Arrows which I can just thoroughly recommend where she's played with real nobility um, but I my Gertrude is um, weak easily led um, wants what she wants but doesn't want there to be a you know a bad public appearance can't everyone just play nice and go along with this and then we'll all be happy and what she wants is um, the sleazy Claudius and she's quite happy to overlook that you know he probably killed my ex-husband but mm. you know um, so that's how I and and she's very sensuous um, hence the six breasts but but also um, sort of a bit sloppy and, and a bit sort of um, slimy so she's she's a kind of malleable slug like body yeah, shape. She's not as dexterous long. as the other characters. No and she has um, she has a very bovine face. Um, yeah and also um, she in, in form like just in vague form she's very similar to Claudius whereas her actual former husband looks looks like a bad match which I found interesting um, Hamlet's father the the King Hamlet uh, looks a, a little bit like um, a bear or dare I say a walkie <laughs> and uh, quite a, a lion like character um, whereas uh, you only see him as a ghost of course because he's he's deceased at the beginning of the play um, but uh, the Gertrude and Claudius look like they kind of probably should have got together in the first place absolutely yeah, yeah. um even though i mean there's that whole question of was was gertrude virtuous to begin with or was she my most seeming virtuous queen and it mm. sounds like everyone made a big mistake um <laughs> but it's interesting so how as a, as a visual artist you can sort of imply these things without having to state them and the implication is somewhat ambivalent at the same time yeah. And it's there for people to detect. It's not sort of stated. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think that's right. But there, there's the ghost, the, the um, lion-like ghost. And there's the, the, uh, I think there's a question raised by the ghost who, as you can see, exists outside the, um, the panels in that black space, you know, perhaps raising the question of how real is he? Is he, a, is he an emanation of people's imaginations or, or, uh, or what is he? Um, and he's very grand and very lion-like, but uh, is that partly Hamlet's exaggerated view of him as a glorious figure? Was mm -hmm. he was he really um, was he really quite so wonderful as Hamlet? Mm -hmm. um, but also Hamlet possibly, makes possibly quite a ruthless killer himself. Exactly. I mean, you have one illustration where he's stabbing away at um, his foes with the with the big um, nib pens. Yeah. And it looks quite violent. And, yeah, quite um, horrible. Yeah. Um, yeah. Quite. I don't think the ghost is a very sympathetic character. Not really. No. Um, but he's he's so important to Hamlet, and he's so important to the to the play. But I don't uh, I I don't think I've painted him as particularly sympathetic. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Um, so would you like to speak a little bit about um, Gatsby and uh, some of the character development there, and how that ties in with the, and also your references and you know, how you create the world of these two books? Yeah, uh, sure. Um, I'll, I'll skip to some of the Gatsby pictures. 
And also layout, I guess, is the most obvious thing that strikes us when we, we compare the two books or even just look at them individually, um, that you're doing something quite different with space and time in both cases. Yeah, and uh, that, is, that is the thing that just fascinates me endlessly about working in this form is the things, that the, the games that you can play with space and time. Um, you will often hear people say, oh, is it a bit like storyboarding for a film? And it does have some things in common with storyboarding. Um, but there's this, there's this magical thing that um, the, the comic or graphic novel form has that storyboarding doesn't. And that is that you have numerous moments in space and time viewed simultaneously on a page. Um, in a film or in a, a storyboard for a film, you're in one present moment after the other. Um, and uh, you're not expected to see a whole lot of things all simultaneously. But in this form, um, you see the page or the double spread as a whole, and that composition will tell you something and give you certain impressions. And actually, some pages from the arrival leap to mind um, where you have that wonderful sequence of the flower, the, the tree or the flower mm. um, through seasons, and you see it as a whole as well yeah. as travelling through time or all the different faces of people from different yeah, countries yeah. in, in um, Sean's work. Um, so you're, you're experiencing all of this together, but you're also moving through left to right, top to bottom. That create problems for you in terms of um, the fact that a book has, uh, just this happens to have this structure where you open it and you have two facing pages. And sometimes you want to show something happening or more importantly, you want to hide something that's going to happen. And damn it, 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 it's sort of like, you know, the pages don't work out. Yeah. Um, was that a problem for you? Uh, well, I mean, it's a problem to be solved in that I had yeah. to, when I was working on the roughs for this, and I did very um, detailed and very, you know, quite polished roughs, um, the roughs were done not just as, um, say, in a sketchbook, but they were done as facing pages because there's a lot of dramatic impact in the page turn and uh, mm -hmm. something dramatic's about to happen. You turn the page and bang, um, it hits you. So it was quite important in working out what was going to be on each page not to spoil the surprise or not to, ha not to end on a note that was jarring. There's a rhythm to... Um, to the pages and um, they have to end at the right point but yep. it, it's tricky because sometimes you're dealing with great big sections of text and you don't want to jam too much text in there so it's a real juggling act and often I would um, be working in facing pages then get to the end of the scene and realise oh, I'm finishing on the wrong side mm -hmm. of the page I've got to rejig this so that it ends nicely Which at is, the end of the page. sounds simple but it can be a huge ordeal because you have to go back and and rejig the entire, often the entire thing, you know, because, exactly. you know, you can't just jump a page. But also, I mean, I guess part of it is, is you're wanting to preserve, just getting back to layout, um, these kind of uh, spreads, for instance. So you want to be able to open a page and have the two pages completely reserved for uh, something like this, which, uh, you know, is kind of like a um, very psychological raw search ink, ink blot. Um, thing going on, yeah. um, whereas it's the preceding pages are quite different. They're sort of more kind of structured and framed. And then occasionally, um, which I always, this is my favourite thing about graphic novels, is when you bust out of the frame, the framing device, uh, which further draws it into relief. So you're aware of how significant the the page composition is as a narrative device and also a conceptual device. Um, and um, I guess. That's true in um, in Gatsby as well, where you're kind of using um, these very discreet um, singular floating panels um, on, a, on a very neutral black space, which is never entered into the picture, um, but to sort of suggest moments of time, like there's kind of like a, sometimes when you read a graphic novel, it's like a, a ticking sound as one panel clicks after another and you can control the speed. Um, and so for here in this particular scene, I guess, there's a kind of slowness and a punctuation of certain pauses and a choice of having um, sort of a wordless panel there, for instance, that sort of thing. Yep, definitely. And I, I think there's, there's um, amazing possibilities for um, pacing in this form using the, the silent panel, for example, yes. but also using... Um, 
the, num the, the layout of the frames, the space around the frames. Um, and it was quite important for me in doing Gatsby that um, there be plenty of black space to give the eye a bit of a rest. Um, the frames are, have quite a lot going on in them mm. and um, it's line work rather than that sort of solid um, ink uh, that you see in Hamlet. So I wanted to, there to... This is actually... Rel for Gatsby, this is quite a lot of frames per page. Um, when you compare to traditional comic books, this is very few frames That's per right. page. And I, I mean, I wanted the eye to have some breathing space, but also that helps with the pacing. And of course, because it is set up as an old photograph album, photograph albums don't usually have every um, square centimetre covered with mm. um, with information and it, I wanted it to feel a little bit leisurely. Um, Hamlet is quite different, it's a bit of a visual onslaught and that's, uh, that's partly because you are sort of um, immersed in this very um, elaborate theatrical world. So, um, I would say it's, yeah, it's elaborate, it's theatrical, it's also a very claustrophobic world because uh, um, most things happen inside the, the castle with a very sort of um, fixed number of characters. Gatsby, they're always driving around in motor cars and it's all out and about, you know, um, let's go to the city, this sort of thing. Whereas um, Hamlet, everything kind of starts to almost like crash inwards. I mean, people go off to, they get sent off to England and stuff, but we don't see any of that. It's almost like the moment you leave the castle, you cease to exist. Yeah. Um, you go into the blackness around the frames. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I was aware of this actually, uh, looking at your book and the repetition of the backgrounds to um, show different scenes, very similar to when you're watching a theatre. And theatre can be quite claustrophobic because it's all on one stage, um, that you are moving within the same space and moreover with this book um, everything is so flat so I think you might have experimented with some dimensionality and depth um, when you started but you ended up collapsing it so that everything almost um, my reading of it was that it was a, a dimension they're living in, a, in some other dimension um, almost like a two-dimensional world they can only slide sideways and so on and pull themselves apart but they can never actually enter and exit or recede very much in fact their scale doesn't change no, much no, in, the, in the whole book that, that's exactly right and th this I think uh, this ties in very much with the limits of the form. It's a little bit of a paradox because in some ways what you can do on the page is absolutely limitless. Um, you are not beholden to the rules of physics or biology and, and I certainly play with that a lot in the, the characters um, morphing and also being sort of going into other dimensions around the page and that's enormous freedom and very exciting. But I think equally importantly you have these limitations um, which I think I've heard you speak about this as well, how, how that can really help you in, in, oh, yes, in yeah. working. And the, the most obvious limitation here is that because the um, characters are, and I'll, I'll just jump to an example, because the characters are playing out a scene in front of, um, in front of a background that's supposed to be a stage set, um, you can't suddenly whiz round to look behind them or above them or underneath them as you as you often would and certainly as we're doing Gatsby jump to a different place in a different time it's really shown from the position of an audience member against this background and that's quite a limitation um, but I actually found that very helpful mm -hmm. um, yeah I, I found that very helpful I think that's that's actually a critical thing um, uh, when when conceiving any book is to be aware of the limitations of your medium and to see that as something positive um, for instance, in my own work, I don't actually include a lot of, of action because pictures aren't so good for showing action. Um, and so I have this static approach. And after a while, after years spent hunched, hunched over a desk, you know, working, you start to become the voice of your medium. It leads you. And so you start to do the things that suit the medium. Um, and it's like, you know, that, that the Chinese saying of every crisis is an opportunity or every, every limitation is a freedom. Yeah, and yeah. so you find it, it actually sets fixed. Um, I mean, having worked, for instance, in, in film, there's almost a little bit too much possibility. I find that kind of problematic. I'm quite frightened by the... Yeah, <laughs> the but books are great because they're so fixed, you know, and so limited. And and I think it for, it, it um, forces you to be very inventive and ingenious Absolutely. in as, doing things within that, as that does limitation. Yeah, Possibly exactly. the most inventive 
medium of, of them all in terms of, you know, the most multimedia, but also um, that you have such limited resources because things have to physically exist. Yeah, exactly. And, and that was something I was sort of, uh, I guess, trying to recreate with those fixed sets. Yeah. But the, I'll, I'll jump to some images of how the sets were done. Mm-hmm. I knew from the beginning that they were going to be inspired by the architecture and the decoration of um, Anthony Gaudi um, because because I love it, because it's uh, otherworldly, because it really plays tricks with um, with our our perception of space and perspective. Um, just a little example there of the interior of the Sagrada Familia and also of part of the roof detail of the um, Casa Batio. It's also so weird and, and um, it's kind of natural in some ways but really artificial it's like a alter- alternative nature yeah quite alien and he was very very inspired by natural forms and um had this extraordinary mathematical brain which i certainly don't have and would build these models based on the natural forms mm. um so i was captivated by that and i wanted to reference that but uh I, even while I was doing, even actually when I'd finished the roughs of, of the book, I still didn't have the proper form of the backgrounds worked out and I had to work that out, uh, sit down and sort of begin to work that out. Um, so initially I had I, an idea that, it would, that I would use painted canvases, painted with acrylics and um, be using the kind of decorative forms of Gaudi but... Um, but architectural styles that were more like real, archi- you know, real architecture um, of castles. And I looked at a lot of books about castles and so on. Um, the problem with this was not only that it's probably not as interesting, but also that the perspective in this picture is very um, fixed and very obvious. And when that's shown to you only in those, um, those sort of panoramic frames which are grabs of part of a stage um, you might be stuck in the bottom part of that image unless you made the characters really really tiny which wouldn't work very well Um, and all of the top and more interesting part would be uh, wasted but also that I'd be I'd be tied to that perspective um, which is really actually very difficult to work in if you've got a fixed background perspective that you can't change and these these characters playing out in front of it so I rejected that idea and decided I had to go for something a little bit more malleable and a little bit more abstract um, and I started playing around with different media this was in pencil uh, I messed around with pencil watercolor computer drawing and then settled on the final um, thing which was acrylic inks and that is a three size so it's the size of the open book and it took weeks <laughs> uh, because each of those little um, each of those little broken tiles is actually painted and then painted over a second time to get sufficient sort of Opacity and, and opacity, but mm. also kind of colours layer a colour layered over another colour. Yeah, a little bit of um, variation, so it doesn't look too thin. Yeah, exactly. Mm. And um, so, boy, that took a long time. But the the, um, the although when you look at it as a whole, you can see some sort of um, perspective. You can cheat a lot when using sections of it. So sometimes the characters will be playing up in the the, the upper half. Sometimes they might be playing down below. The the red parts at the bottom could be mist or they could be liquid or they could be something else. Also, um, gravity and light aren't big issues in this sort of world. So um, it's a bit like a Petri dish or something. They can just slide around and hang upside down and cavort and... Yeah, yeah, yeah. 